Hello and welcome to How to Prepare for Finance Recruiting this summer. I'm Stephanie Hessler, the Career Community Advisor for Consulting, Finance, Business, and Entrepreneurship. I'm also an alumna and I worked in the investment industry myself for 16 years. This particular recording is a new recording of a webinar that I delivered to this community on July 24, 2016, 2017, excuse me. And the purpose of this webinar is to help you learn some really important things. One, how important it is to be really proactive in your preparation if you're interested in recruiting in the financial industry. Second, to learn to present yourself in your strength. And third, to learn about accessing resources. There are lots of resources available and I want to point them out to you. This webinar is open to all classes here at Wellesley, including those of you who may be new to finance and others of you may already be very familiar with finance. So because it's, it's open to everyone, my, my presentation is going to be very general. And how are we going to spend our time during this webinar? First of all, what I want to do is review the industry, to give you an overview of the finance industry. Secondly, I want to help you to identify opportunities. Next, to help you understand the recruiting process and timing. Then I'd like to help you also to prepare high impact resume and cover letters. And lastly, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, to be able to access resources. We're going to talk about access, accessing resources. And because this is a new recording of the prior webinar, we obviously won't have opportunity here for, for Q&A. So let's get started now on our overview of the finance industry. What is the finance industry? So the finance industry provides financial services to clients, both individual clients and organizational corporate clients worldwide. It's a global industry. And there are different types of companies, and the distinctions are really important. We have limited time on our webinar, so I'm going to describe the different categories here in the most general basic terms. And let's start with commercial banks. So you all know commercial banks. I'm sure they're, they are you know, there uh, in the town of Wellesley, we have some commercial banks, right? An example is, is Century Bank, for example, or Bank of America has a commercial bank. And, you know, commercial banks do lots of different things, but they provide loans to individuals and companies and organizations. They also accept deposits from their clients. You know, if you're buying a car, you could get a car, a loan to finance your car, an, a home a mortgage to finance your home, right? So banks play, commercial banks play a really important um, role in our everyday lives. Now investment banks are different and they help their corporate clients to raise capital and they also advise their clients in mergers and acquisitions. Examples of, of investment banks are Goldman Sachs, Lazard, JP Morgan Chase, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch is also an investment bank in addition to commercial bank, um, Citibank, same with them, Credit Suisse. So those are investment banks. They help their clients to raise capital and, buy, and advise their clients on mergers and acquisitions. Now investment management, also known as asset management, is where professional, where professional managers manage the investments of securities for their clients who want to meet certain investment goals. And examples of two really large investment management firms are, say, Fidelity or State Street, both Boston headquartered companies. Next, we have alternative funds. And alternative funds are, for example, hedge funds or real estate funds or private equity funds. These are alternative investments. They tend to be higher risk, and they're investment vehicles that are not regulated, they're unregulated. And next, another category is insurance companies. And insurance companies help protect clients from financial losses or to manage, help them with managing their risks. And then we have other categories, a few of them, for example, like credit card companies. We all know American Express or Visa, right? These are all global multinational companies 
that offer credit card and other services. And some of these companies are, you know, large financial conglomerates that represent several of these categories, right? So Bank of America, for example, has commercial banking and investment banking and investment management and so on, right? Other firms are highly specialized in one particular area. So it's important for you to understand the distinctions between the different types of companies because some of them do very, very different things. But on this webinar, we want to really focus in on investment banks and investment management. They, um, um, I know a lot of students are interested in investment banking and investment management, and we also have great interest from these types of firms in recruiting our students. And it's really important for you to understand some of the real basics of, of these industries. So what exactly is investment banking again? We talked a few minutes ago about it's about raising capital, right? But think about it. It's got the word investment and it's got the word banking, but it's not really just one or the other of those, right? Going back to the definition, investment banks help clients with raising capital. So, for example, raising capital through the public markets through selling stocks, for example, like an initial public offering, an IPO. Uh, today, it's August 10th, 2017. And I noticed in the Wall Street Journal, right on the front page, there's a section about um, Tesla, right, who's a very innovative automobile company, is um, raising $1.5 billion of high-yield bonds to fund their manufacturing capabilities. So companies and, you know, other entities need to raise capital, often for, for growth. Like, this is a perfect example that Tesla is a growing company and needs to access, in this case, the, the bond markets to raise, the debt markets to raise capital. Now, investment banks also advise their clients on, on M&A, which is mergers and acquisitions. And mergers and acquisitions are, you know, they're different from one another, but we often have them, you know, in that one category, M&A. And investment bankers advise their clients, their companies, on taking over another company or merging with another company. And a recent example is Amazon buying, has announced that it's buying Whole Foods for $13 billion. And Goldman Sachs is there, is the M&A advisor. And, you know, one of the things you have to realize is that there's a process here, right? And it's a complex process. So an investment banks advise their clients on that M&A process. Investment banks also trade securities. So you see here sales and trading, right? And this can be for clients, but also for their own account, right? For their own proprietary trading. Investment banks have other areas too, like research, for example. Some investment banks have very large research departments where research professional, professionals closely follow companies and industries in order to be able to make investment recommendations to their investor clients. So investment banks are what's considered the sell side. This is one side of Wall Street, so to speak. And sell, sell side professionals issue, recommend, trade, and sell securities for the investors on the buy side who buy them. So now let's move over to the buy side. Okay, and what is investment management. Well, it's also known as asset management, and wealth management is part of investment management. There are some investment banks who also have investment management arms, right? So, so these can, uh, companies can be purely investment management firms, um, but they can also be associated with other types of, of financial services. And in investment management and asset management, what, what they do here is to invest assets to meet their clients' financial goals. One way is through pooling the funds of their investors, okay? Sometimes this is research-based. So if you've heard of positions that are like equity research where you work with a portfolio manager who manages, generally it can be, you know, pooled funds can range in all types of sizes and hundreds of millions of dollars and, and more, right? 
and they can have certain growth objectives, like investing in growth stocks, for example. So sometimes some are research-based, some are index funds, okay? And this is where a portfolio manages a market index like the S&P Standard & Poor's 500, for example. Another thing is that in our world today, we have increased quantitative investing. And this is where decisions are made by quantitative methods and not through what um, was traditional fundamental equity research, for example. Now, wealth management falls into investment management. And this is where firms and their professionals will work with individuals or with families to help them build and preserve their wealth by investing in securities and in, in funds. So that is wealth management. And this is called the buy side, right? This is the other side of quote unquote Wall Street from the sell side. They are buying the securities um, for, their, for their investor clients. More and more, the industry is quantitatively driven. But one thing that's really important for you to know is that investment management impacts people all over the world, right? And it's important because it can be um, an, an incredibly important source of building wealth for individuals and families. Okay, how do you identify opportunities? Now, most of these firms have entry-level professional positions for undergraduates, including summer internships. And many of the investment management, the asset management firms who recruit on Wellesley, also post their position on Handshake. So I want to be sure that you are regularly checking Handshake, Handshake for positions. Secondly, I want to point out a resource that I've started to build in career education for those opportunities with investment banks and other investment firms that may not be listed on, on Handshake. And what you need to do is go into the resources section in Handshake, then go into the consulting, finance, business, and entrepreneurship section, go into the finance section, and as you go, as you scroll through the document, you'll see it's the same, um, same link in two different areas on that document. One is under networking and professional development events. The other is on recruitment in general. And there's a spreadsheet that lists as many of the investment banking and some investment management opportunities that aren't posted on Handshake. It's not a complete list at this point, but it's in development. And by the way, if any of you know of opportunities that aren't on the list, please feel free to, um, to send them to me. Additionally, you know, you should just really have your ears open and be picking up what you can, maybe from being in your clubs or networking about any leads that you might hear. You may also want to um, check the Hive regularly because we invite alumni to post positions that they're aware of at their company, so I would encourage you to also check the Hive. And during the uh, academic year, when I'm not able to post certain positions just because there might be too many on, on Handshake and they're not posted by the employer, I will send messages to students through some of the student clubs. So if you're in Wealthy Women in Business or some of the investment clubs, be sure that you're also um, reading those emails. So let's go now into what the process is and the timing. And the first thing that you really need to do is your research, right? So as you've been able to see from this presentation, there are a lot of differences between investment banks and investment management firms and commercial banks and insurance companies, right? It's really different kind of work and different types of entry-level positions. So it's important for you to not only research the industries, but also to research the job descriptions and see if, if this is a fit for you. The second thing is that it's important to network, to talk to people. We have a career fair coming up in September in which we'll have different types of finance companies represented, and I encourage you to go and talk to the representatives for the companies. Or when alumni are on campus, to come to events or to info sessions. 
where you can really pick up information about the companies and industries and also get to know the professionals, including alumni. A lot of alumni come back on campus to represent their companies and that's a wonderful opportunity to, um, to network with alumni, as well as reaching out to alumni who work at, at these companies. The next step, and we're gonna talk a little bit about this this evening, is putting your documents together. You'll need your cover letter and a resume. And then lastly, of course, is the, you know, getting the, the application process. And with investment banks, particularly, the application process is starting earlier and earlier. In some cases, it, they already opened up in June and July, I believe. So um, it's really early to, it's really important to be sure that you're very proactive in the application process. And it also, um, ends pretty quickly. Some of them already end of August or early September. Okay. Now for, um, for first years and sophomores, investment banks um, offer what they call diversity programs. And these are programs where students um, at Wellesley are invited to submit the, uh, an application. These are very competitive processes. And if you're selected, you're invited to visit their home office in New York City or wherever, it, it generally New York City, but other cities too, um, and spend a day or two with them networking and, and in educational programs. And for those of you who are, who are first years of sophomores, I encourage you, if you're really interested in, in this industry and in finance, in investment banking in particular, these diversity programs are feeders into um, um, summer internships and the junior internship in particular with investment banks is a feeder to, the full, to a full-time job offer. So these are really important to um, keep your eye on the diversity programs. And in January and February, I'll be sending out announcements about preparing for the diversity program. Now, this, um, this summer, um, there are firms like J.P. Morgan, for example, has what is called a winning women program. And from everything I understand, that is a really important program for wealthy women to apply to in order to enter into um, the recruiting world at, at J.P. Morgan. And I believe that that deadline is um, actually coming up very soon in August. So. Back on process and timing, how, how does this work? So you'll have a first round interview, and this will be, could be in person, could be by phone, could be by video, right? And if you're selected to, um, uh, to continue in the process with them, you will eventually end up at a super day with them where you are at their headquarters for half a day, likely, with multiple interviews, where they are really make, checking you out, making sure that you're, you're a great fit for them and that you have the skills that they need. And super days are really important, but they're also very, very uh, intense. So be prepared uh, for an intense couple of hours when you go to a super day. Now, one thing to know about investment banks in particular is that there's a pattern towards what the, what's called exploding offers. And if, an, if you receive an offer, they may give you a very short amount of time to get back to them. So this is something that's important for you to be aware of. I know students are often shocked when they learn that they only have a few days to, to reflect on the offer and if they want to take it, um, either for a summer or a, a full-time offer. So it's important for you to prepare, and this is why I want you to be so proactive um, and really know the companies, because different companies have different cultures, right? And you want to end up with a firm where you've got the best cultural fit. So you'll have to make an important decision uh, with the exploding offer. Are you going to accept the offer, or will you continue interviewing? And one thing that's important for you to know is that once you have accepted an offer, at career education, 
we feel that it's really important at that point that you stop interviewing. Because if you have an offer, you really can't continue to interview. So be sure that, um, that the offer is the, is the one that, that you want. And I know that this can be a really tough process because it all happens so fast. But I wanted to bring that to your attention. And then I thought I would just share with you quickly, I found this on YouTube. It's uh, created by the Wall Street Journal, uh, a short three-minute video about how to get hired at Goldman Sachs. And I thought it had some really interesting points just about the the uh, recruiting process, generally speaking, at an investment bank. All right, so let's talk more about the process and timing. So interviews, what are interviews like? Well, the first round, as I mentioned, can, is, could be in person, it could be by phone, or it could be a video interview, okay? Now, what's really important on the phone is that you speak clearly and project your voice if you're on a phone interview. There's nothing worse than being on a phone and not being able to understand the person on the other end. So be sure that you're speaking clearly and enunciating clearly and projecting your voice. And with video, if you have a video interview, I want to encourage you to practice first. Be sure that you are rehearsing as best you can before the official video and film yourself. Film yourself on your phone, right? Ca record yourself. Capture yourself so that you can then go back and make corrections as, as needed. The second thing is it's really important to know the company. Do your research. Know the company. They may ask you a question about why exactly do you want to work for them, okay? So do your research on the company. Be familiar with some of the deals or some of the um, uh, in investments that they may be involved in. It's important to, that you have done your homework and that you show up um, confident about your knowledge of, of the company. The third thing is know your resume. And this ties in with knowing yourself, right? We'll talk a little more about this in a minute. Then knowing financial concepts and practice, practice, practice. I can't stress enough how vitally important it is to practice, practice, practice. Okay, so more on the process and timing. I want to talk a little bit about um, financial concepts because this is an area where investment banks in particular, investment companies as well, but investment banks in particular have a very high expectation in terms of your comfort level with key financial concepts, okay? So for example, in investment banking, it's important that you're familiar and comfortable with what are financial statements and analysis understanding generally financial markets, being comfortable talking about, say, some type of security. Okay, so be sure that you're following a stock maybe because someone may ask you a question about, about um, the market and investing or securities, um, investing in securities. And valuation. Valuation is another important topic. We don't have the time to go into any of those in depth here, but I want to be sure that they are on your radar screen in terms of areas that you should be really getting deep understanding of if you are serious about investment banking. They may ask you questions during your interviews that require you to demonstrate your conceptual understanding, not just that you've memorized concepts, okay? So that's why it's so important to be really proactive in this process so that you give yourself plenty of time to understand these concepts. Now, sales and trading is different from in investment banking. Um, and, you know, the interview process is, is a little different. Um, sales and trading is more transactional and you're making quick um, decisions. So the approach in sales and trading might be different. And I encourage you to network and with with um, individuals and, in, and other students in sales and trading so that you can become and learn about the, the interview process here. And then equity research, for example, 
some of the similar concepts that we've talked about in investment banking, but you may be asked, for example, to, um, to do a stock pitch and to present it um, as part of your interview process. So this is not something that you can learn in an hour. Again, it's a process where it's important for you to understand um, the, you know, the, the concepts generally so that you can apply them. And most importantly, that you know, it's not about getting answers necessarily right, but interviewers want to understand your thinking process, okay? And to be sure that, again, you understand conceptually the, um, the concepts and are comfortable, are at ease with them. In Handshake, in, in the finance resources, we've got some, some information, books, website resources that you can access to understand financial concepts. Now, something I want to stress is that investment banking in particular is really, really competitive. And it is vitally important for you to learn financial concepts. I also want to encourage all of you who are interested in, in finance and investments to take an accounting class, a financial accounting class, um, and financial markets um, classes. I know the econ department offers um, financial markets, but financial accounting either at MIT or Wellesley, because these are some of the basic languages of companies and markets, and it's important that you learn these. So you've really got to do some heavy lifting in order to prepare for, um, for these industries. The, um, the recruiting process has become so competitive that um, I can't stress enough how vitally important it is to do that upfront learning about um, fundamental finance concepts. Okay, back to um, process and timing. So it's a little bit different for different classes. And as I mentioned a few minutes ago, many of the investment banks in particular offer um, day or two or two day programs generally in the spring where they invite first years and sophomores um, to apply. It's a competitive application process. And if you're accepted, you are invited to, to visit their home office and to spend a day or two uh, networking at, uh, and at uh, educational events and learning about the culture of the company. So one thing that's really important for you to know is that you've got to treat this almost like an interview. You've got to be really prepared and network and just absorb as much as you can, but also be on your very best behavior because they're checking all of you out for future summer interns. And it starts early. It starts um, in, in these diversity programs. Now, most of the internships, from what I understand, at investment banks and investment firms are for juniors. So this is where um, the junior intern internship is really the primary feeder for investment banks for the full-time positions. So those of you who are really, really serious about investment banking, that junior internship is very important. And of course, the sooner you can get into the process through the diversity um, and one and two day programs in the spring are really important. And Wellesley students are invited to participate in these, in these um, day programs. So if you're interested, you absolutely should apply. And I'll be making an announcement in late January, early February, about that process and helping uh, those of you who are first years and sophomores to prepare. So for seniors, my understanding is that there are very few positions open to seniors because they've been offered to the juniors, excuse me, to rising seniors who had the summer, uh, the summer junior internships. However, there are always exceptions. So if you're a senior and and um, you're looking for an investment banking position, uh, definitely you know, keep at it because as I said, there, there are much fewer opportunities, but, but there, I've certainly seen some exceptions myself. One of the things I wanna stress is that investment banking in particular is very, very competitive. 
but there is something for everyone. It might not be at an investment bank, but there are lots of other opportunities. There are so many recruiters in the finance world, in the investment business, in wealth management, in insurance, and many other types of finance companies who recruit at Wellesley. And so I want to be sure that, um, that you are aware of that, that there are lots of opportunities in finance generally, even if investment banking might be really, really competitive. Okay, so let's talk now about the documents that you need, resumes and cover letters. And specifically, um, resumes that are geared towards finance and investment jobs. It's really important that your resume is one page. It cannot be more than one page. And it's to tell your story. And it's to clearly present your past and current experiences and accomplishments. It's your marketing tool, right? It's, it's what you give to someone so that they can quickly learn all about you. And it has to be relevant to the position, okay? So be careful that it's not a laundry list of everything that you've done, but relevant to finance, for example. Now, in finance, especially investment banking and the investment business, it's important to have kind of a uniform look. So no colors or fancy font or photos, nothing like that. Keep it simple, kind of black and white. The examples that we have in, um, in Handshake for Resumes are that uniform sort of look. And I also want to point out we have examples in in Handshake, so I want to be sure that you're really going through all that information carefully if you're putting your, your resume together for the first time. Something else that I want to point out is that put yourself in the seat of the reader. Some of these firms receive thousands of resumes, and you want to stand out. So put yourself in the seat of the reader and ask yourself, am I presenting myself clearly, right? Is there depth here? Is there texture here? Am I really telling my story here? Can they have a clear understanding of who I am and that I'm qualified to work in, in finance? So this process, of course, requires a lot of self-reflection and, and um, self-awareness and reflection. Putting a good resume together is, is hard work, and it takes uh, introspection. So the first part, there are different sections to a resume. The, the header and education is the top part. The second part is the, is the experience and leadership section. And then the third section are your, your summary of other skills. So I just want to point out that this is the example that we use at Wellesley as our core programming example, I would suggest for finance positions that you put your name and contact information in the center. That's a little bit more of that, of that uniform look. And then of course for education, you know, you can follow a format like this. Now, what goes in the education section? I would recommend that you do include your major and other information, other detail that is applicable is if you've studied abroad, right? You want to add that to your education. If you've been cross-registered at MIT or at Babson, put that in. If you have relevant coursework, you know, uh, financial markets, financial accounting, economics of this or that, right? Put that in. And you can also add your GPA. Now, something that I also want to point out is often I see resumes where the, the study abroad or the cross-registration -registra institutions are listed separately from Wellesley. And personally, I feel that that can be very confusing because it makes it look like you might have another degree from that college. So what I recommend is that you list it as a bullet under Wellesley College. It's part of your Wellesley College education. And another thing that's important is that after your sophomore year, your high school details need to come off of your resume. You've really got to focus on college and what uh, the experiences that you're having at college. 
All right, so the next section is the experience section. And I want to encourage you also to add, after experience, to add a section where, that's called leadership. So a whole section on its own that's called leadership. And um, the point here is that you want to be able to succinctly express in bullet format, for example, not just your tasks, what you did at jobs or internships, but what you actually accomplished, your, the impact and your results. So let's take this example here, okay? So raised over 5,000 through phone-a-thon calls by providing excellent cu customer service and having meaningful conversations with alumni about the Wells experience and future plans of the college, okay? So that doesn't just say, oh, um, assisted with phone-a-thon calls to alumni, right? We're just giving a lot more depth. It gives much more sense of what you actually accomplished and your impact and the results you raised, you were part of a team that raised $5,000, okay? Or, for example, led campus-wide fundraiser, excuse me, led campus-wide fundraiser raising $2,500 for Haiti Relief Funds to rebuild, school, rebuild schools after earthquake, okay? So, again, we're showing impact and results and accomplishment, and it's got depth here, right? We can see that, that um, You've been impo involved with, with something that really was quite an accomplishment, raising $2,500 for Haiti Relief Funds. You may also want to add a second section. In, in this particular example, um, work and leadership is kind of put into experience generally. But for finance and investment resumes, I recommend that you add a separate leadership experience. And it, excuse me, leadership section. And it's really important, if you are serious about finance and investment banking in particular, that you um, really try to get experience, even if you work at a nonprofit for a summer, to get business and finance experience, okay? So the, that's what you will include in your experience. And then your leadership, you can talk about clubs or activities or um, uh, your work that really where you were are a leader. So let's move on now to the next section. So how do you do this? Really write a good bullet. Start with an action verb. And we've got a list of action verbs in resources in Handshake in our resume and cover letter section. You want to be able to express briefly what you did. Anytime you can quantify something, like if you know the, the twenty-five hundred dollars raised for the Haiti relief, right? You want to quantify whatever you can because that makes it easy to understand. And then you want to add additional descriptive information to give it more depth. And this is what really distinguishes a good resume bullet. Um, this is what really makes a good res a, excuse me a competitive resume is when you've got that that depth you really show Im impact and results and and outcome another important thing for you to keep in mind is when you think about your bullets right you might want to have two or three bullets for to describe a, a an experience um, think about leadership so areas where you initiated, where you started something on your own, but also be able to express collaboration and teamwork, as well as your ability to work independently, right? So you want to show that leadership and being a self-starter and being able to do things independently, but to also show the uh, collaboration, because in business, we often work as part of, of teams. All right. I want to give you a couple of examples, more examples of accomplishment statements. So here's an example of a, of a kind of a task statement that doesn't have much depth. So before, it's prepare daily market report. And after, this is the improved one, is prepare daily stock market performance and summarize news announcements for 20 companies, including Nike and Amazon, for investment team. That just is such a difference, right? And I see, I work with students every day, right? So, so 
some of you who have worked with me know that we do this kind of work, right? So go deeper in terms of what you did so that you can give more texture in your resume. Here's another example. This would be like a leadership example. Led on-campus events and fundraising. So give it more depth. Quantify it. Show impact and results. Led and marketed six on-campus events and grew, grew membership by 25%. Spearheaded fundraising and raised $2,000 to cover programming costs. See what a big difference that is, right? There's so much more of a sense of who you are and what you're capable of when you give, give that um, impact and quantify and focus on showing your results. And then the last section is skills. And what I recommend for uh, business, students interested in business and investment banking and the investment industry is to add, change it to skills and interests. You know, sometimes in, in um, business and investment banking in particular, you can end up traveling with some of your colleagues for days. And, you know, you want to be with interesting people. So you can also feel free to, you know, if you like world travel and um, skiing, you know, add a section, a little section that, that has that, for example. Okay, so that's kind of a real brief summary of high impact resumes. And what I want to do now is talk a little bit about cover letters. And I want to st stay, start by saying, you know, that cover letters can be, can be hard, but I want you to think in terms of keeping it easy, right? Keeping the process easy. And a cover letter is really a companion for the resume. And it makes that connection from your experiences and skills and interests to the position and the organization. So even though the cover letter is about you, it's also about your employer and it's the future employer and about the job. It's very important for you to study keywords in the job description and incorporate those into the letter. And it also provides a context for the skills that you have that are transferable to what the employer needs. It is a letter, right? So be sure that your name and contact information is up at the top, that it's got the date, and that it's got the employer's contact information up at the top too. If you can put somebody's name on it, like if you met someone at a networking event and you can uh, address the letter to them, fantastic. Always better to have a name for an individual on the letter. And good writing is really important. The purpose of the cover letter is to persuade the reader why they should interview you and to persuade them that you are bringing value to them, that you have high potential, right? So put yourself in the seat of the reader. As, as I've mentioned, your reader is getting thousands of cover letters and resumes, right? And you want your letter to flow and be easy to read, it should have three main parts, an opening section, a body, and a conclusion. Again, just like with resume, it's a process of self-awareness and reflection. You cannot tell them everything about you, okay? So let's, here's an example of an introductory paragraph. And what you see in blue is why you're writing this letter, in green, who you are, and in red, what you're going to explain in the body of the resume. Again, think about the reader. I read that Goldman Sachs receives 100,000 resumes, and I assume that means cover letters too. So you want to stand out, right? Who are you? So for example, it is with enthusiasm that I submit my application for the summer intern analyst position at XYZ Investment Bank. I'm a junior at Wellesley College majoring in economics. I had the opportunity to meet with professionals and speak with Mary Doe at your XYZ undergraduate day last April. I'm very interested in finance and investment banking and welcome the opportunity to contribute at your bank with my experience in financial markets, investment research, and leadership. So whenever you have a connection to the company, like in this case, you met with an individual, you, you network, right? And you're letting them know that you've been at the undergraduate day, you wanna be sure 
to put that at the very top of your, in your opening paragraph. Now the body of the paragraph, this is the real meat of your letter, okay? And this is where you are sharing two or three of your top skills and qualities that are relevant to the position. And that's why it's so important to read the job description carefully and be sure that you are describing skills that you have and qualities that you have, which are actually what they need. So these could be like analytical skills, communication skills, leadership, right? You should carefully read the cover letter, the job description in order to determine which are the, say, three qualities that you want to focus in on to, to tell them that you have. And it's important to give evidence, in other words, that you've done something, whether it was a classroom related, academic related, or work experience, that shows them that you have relative experience that relates to what they need. It tells more in depth than a resume does, so it'll go into more evidence, more depth than a resume. It's also really important, and this goes back to often, especially for investment banks, some of these firms are receiving tens of thousands of resumes. So it's really important that you communicate your genuine and sincere interest and enthusiasm. And again, the real purpose of a cover letter is to persuade the reader, right, that you um, have the skills that, that, that they need, that they should be interviewing you, that you're bringing value, and that you're someone who is, is a high potential candidate for them. And remember, bring in some of the key words from, from the job description. I know it seems like a cover letter is about you, and it is, it is about you, but importantly, it's also about the employer. They are trying to fill a position at their company. So you've got to make the connection between, it's like a bridge between who you are and what they need. And then you want to have a brief conclusion. And this is an example of a, of a brief conclusion. I'm not going to read it out loud. Um, but, you know, it wraps up and closes the letter. And importantly, you know, good writing is a really important aspect of working in business. And especially um, in investment banks and, and, and investment firms, right, communication is an important part of the job. So um, be sure that you focus on writing a good solid cover letter that really flows, is tight, and um, persuades them that you are the right person for the job. All right, so we're going to be coming to the end of our webinar pretty soon, and what I want to do before we close is just talk to you about some of the resources that are available to you as um, Wellesley College students. And first of all, you know, hopefully you're all familiar with career education and you can schedule an appointment with me. Um, that is done through Handshake. I also will have we call them pop-up advising hours where you'll be able to come see me uh, in September and October of 2017. I'll be having two different dates of pop-up hours. So be sure to go on Handshake so that you can, um, you can meet me. I'll be at Lulu. Uh, if you need to see me kind of on a last minute issue and can't, uh, aren't able to schedule an appointment. We'll also be offering a resume and cover letter workshop on Thursday, September 14th, and I encourage you to attend, and that can also be an opportunity for you to come and um, have your resume. I could have a look at your resume and also give you feedback, and you can pick up some new information, hopefully, at the, um, at the workshop. We're also offering a boutique finance and business career fair on Tuesday, September 9th, We'll have an adjacent consulting fair on the same evening, and I invite all of you who are interested in finance to participate. This is a fantastic networking opportunity where you'll be able to come and meet representatives. There'll be alumni from, from finance companies, 
ask questions, get to know the cultures, and get to see different companies in different sectors of finance. And be sure that you're checking Handshake regularly for jobs that are posted, events, info sessions. Companies also offer site visits. Last um, winter, State Street invited Wellesley students for a site visit to their Boston office. Those are fantastic learning opportunities. And I want to encourage you also to go into resource in, into the finance uh, category, where I've got lots of information there uh, that you should be reading in order to find out more about finance, um, the finance industry, how you can learn financial concepts, and the spreadsheet that we have there, which lists many of the investment banking and some investment opportunities. We also have access to the vault. So as a Wellesley student, you can go into the vault. You get there through resources on Handshake. And they have some pretty, pretty specific and very high quality information about um, the finance industry and the different categories within finance. So I encourage you to use that resource. And then lastly, also be sure that you're um, checking the Hive. Networking, um, it's a great networking tool. And um, we're encouraging alumni to post um, jobs there when they're aware of them. So that could be another really wonderful resource for you to find information about jobs as well. So we're now at the end of the webinar. And my key takeaways for you is how very important it is for you to be proactive. And this is especially so for investment banking and investment management positions where the expectation of your uh, technical knowledge of finance concepts is very high. And this, this isn't something you can do in you know, the night before. You've really got to start learning some of these concepts early so that you can speak about them in a conceptual manner and demonstrate your understanding. We talked about presenting yourself in in your strengths, and that starts with your cover letter and your resume, and getting through that that first first process, so to speak. Practice, practice, practice for interviews. Um, you're welcome to make an appointment with me on Handshake in order to so that we can uh, do mock interview. But um, the interviews are so very important, and it is really important that you practice. And that you also practice uh, responding not only to questions about you and your resume, but you will have finance and investment type questions. So as you practice, be sure that you're also practicing those, vitally important. And then third, um, I want to be sure that you're aware that there are lots of resources available to you and that you should absolutely be taking advantage of all of those. So that ends our webinar. And I want to wish everyone much um, great success with your recruiting journey. Good night.